commitments and what have you. Friends, I'm calling us back to discipleship and to be being discipled. And so this year, there's just emphasis after emphasis after emphasis. Be ye discipled. Have yourself under a process where you're being discipled. Listen, Wednesday is going to be huge for discipleship in this church. Lots of change is going to take place. I told you I'm going to elaborate on that more, not today. After I had an opportunity to speak to the ministry directors, the next people who will hear would be you. But we really want to change the pablum expression of Christianity. Mind you, I don't know where you're getting that from because I don't think this church teaches that. But we're going straight at this commitment idea. We're going straight at this, this, this idea that we can give to the Lord that which cost us nothing. We're going straight at that. And the expectation is change. The expectation is change. Some persons bless their heart. You only see them when they have some ministry to do in grace. Appreciate your being here. The faithfulness is coming out in your ministry. But friends, you ain't doing no one any favor. You need to come out for yourself and be ministered to, whether you're in any kind of ministry or not. Friends, we need help to know how to run our families, and that's going to become a priority. We need help to know how to get along with each other in church and in our families. We need help, friends. And so we're going to have the Word of God laid bare, and we're going to be helped in all these areas. But you can't be helped if you don't show up. Amen? Amen. Now today I'm going to hit this business of priority and how to best maximize your time hard. And friends, I'm not just talking because that's what you hire me to do. I'm preaching today in order to effect change. You got me? So please don't be happy that we got together to the church. We sang and we gave to the Red Cross and we gave our tithes and so forth. And once again, Pastor Lyle preached good. And oh boy, praise the Lord, we got a nice thing going here. Friends, that ain't what I'm into. That's a wonderful thing of all that's the case, but friends, I would have failed. And you would have failed if change was not affected in you as a result of the presentation of the Word of God. So let's listen. Heard the song? We need to hear from you. We need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, what will we do? Right back to the same old way of doing things. Let God's word challenge your convictions. Let God's word change your opinion. Let God's word interrupt your fruitless life and make it fruitful by a change of priorities. That's what we're aiming for today. Amen? Amen. You see, folks, we're very busy, busy, busy people. We're always, always, always running from one thing to the next. We're busy, we're overloaded. We're always in a hurry. We walk fast, talk fast, instant this, instant oatmeal, instant grits, instant everything. is fast, 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 fast. And if things weren't fast enough, there used to be only one or two ways you could get a hold of someone. You had to go to them or you call them. Or you drop something in the mail. Now, text message, email, phone call, cell phone. I mean, you just get inundated. There's just information overload. It's busy, 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 busy. The streets are busy. Everything is busy. And because we're so overwhelmed, we're constantly apologizing. Sorry, no time, got to run. We can't even sit down and have a decent meal together as families because someone got to go somewhere and they got to do it now. There's a passage of Scripture that I believe can be of help to us as we look forward to this new church calendar year. If you listen to it, Here's what God's Word is telling us. Remember, we need to hear from you, Lord. What are you saying to us? What, what do you want us to do? How do you want us to think? Help us, Lord. If that's our posture, if that's our attitude, listen to this. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Be very careful how you live. Now, don't hear that general. Don't hear that general. Put your name there. Lyle. I'm talking to you. Be careful how you live. The Spirit of God would say, Charles, this message is for you. Be careful how you live. Sister Cynthia, be careful how you live. Dave, be careful how you live. Ramona, be careful how you live. Sister Ruth, be careful how you live. Andy, Kathy, Kevin, be careful how you live. Tanya, be careful how you live. Be careful. Think about it. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. 
Making the most of every opportunity. That's how you can be careful how you live, folks. That's one of the ways. By making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, which suggests that we certainly can be very foolish with how we live. Not careful, but foolish. But instead, we need to understand what the Lord's will is. Powerful bit of scripture. You can go ahead and underline that, highlight that in your Bibles. You need to know that. That needs to be memorized. That, that, that verse needs to be able to haunt you. You see, when you memorize scripture, you've got something in there for the Holy Spirit to work with. Remember Jesus says the Holy Spirit will bring back to your remembrance the things that he said. God speaks to us through his word. When we've got his word in us, the Holy Spirit can speak to us through that word. And I've had many of those occasions, and so have a number of you. Sometimes the Spirit of God just got to give me the chapter and verse. Aim got to say, aim got to remind me what the verse is. I know that. Oh, Philippians 4, 6. Yeah, Lord, I hear you. Some of you don't know what that is. But sad of you who know what it is to be fretful and to cast your anxieties upon the Lord, you know what that is. All right? In this passage, the Apostle Paul presents some important lessons that we need to consider. The first one, our time on this earth is limited. Our time on this earth is limited. Listen, friends, <laughs> you've you got to understand that. We buried a, a beloved sister yesterday, 49 years old, about to hit 50. I mean, who, who didn't think she was going to live into her 50s and into 60s and 70s? But you know what? Time is limited. One day she's doing fine. Next day she collapses, falls into a coma. Several days later she's dead. Heard another story like that, similar one just this morning, talking to one of the church members. Goes to the doctor's office. They examine her. Light barrel, blood count one. Gone. Friends, but whether you go with dengue or car accident or something else, your time is limited. Don't act like you could live 70 years. And you're 35, so you could do with what you want. You might die at 35 and two days. Your time is limited. That's the first thing you need to be aware of. Your time is limited. Stop acting like you've got plenty of time. You do not. There we go. Don't procrastinate. Your time is limited. You don't know when your number can get called. And so with a time being limited, here's what the psalmist says. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Friends, there's no real change unless you allow the scripture to talk to you in that regard. If you do not have an awareness that your life is fleeting and that you will give an account for your life to God. You see... When you get that in perspective and you know your time is fleeting and you have a family and some other things, your boss don't dictate to you what you need to do. I wish someone out there was hearing me. You see, there's some priorities from which you, for which you will have to give an accounting for. And your boss could care less about them when he piles up work upon work with you. And when he does that and you're a mother and your family is neglecting, being neglected for every hour he piles up on you. Friends, something got to give. And if you give out, he can hire somebody else. There needs to be a talk, needs to be a sitting down. Listen, sir. Listen, sir. Perhaps you're not aware of the fact that I am a mother of three children. And those children have homework to do. There's pickups, there's this, that, and the other. Sir, I will give you my 100%, but that 100% has some time requirements wrapped up around it. Now, I want you to treat me as a valued employee, not as a slave. Now, friends, if you feel you can't talk to your boss like that, you're in the wrong job. You're in the wrong job. You're in the wrong job. Because I'll tell you, you don't have to answer to them, but you have to answer to your God and to your family, and you will neglect them if they, you do not make them intentionally, by schedule and time, your priority. It's not going to happen. Your days are fleeting. You don't know how long you have. But because you have a fleeting amount of time and you don't know when that's going to be, make sure you prioritize your life. And make sure that priority is always in your head, not a, a principle in the back of your mind that you may or may not remember in a given day. Show me, O oh Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. And then again, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if you have strength. They quickly pass and we fly away. 
Now I realize that for some of you younger folks, 70 or 80 years sounds like a long, long time. In fact, I can remember when I thought anyone over 40 was ancient. But no longer. It's all relative. I remember when I thought people who was 50 was old. I mean, we talking, you ain't over the hill, you down from the top of the hill. Friends, I am two years short of 50 and I can tell you, it ain't so. <laughs> Devil is a liar. Devil is a liar. Sometimes I feel like I'm still 17 in, in, in mind, but boy, not in body. My bodies remind me, you know, we didn't cash this check a little while ago, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you how relative time is. For the teenager in love, talking together in a car, an hour or two seems like a blink of time. But to the parents inside, <laughs> looking through that window, that hour seems like an eternity. Eternity of fretting, eternity of rage, an eternity of God help them. Yeah, when this boy going home or what wrong with this, you know? Time is relative, depends on what side of it you're looking at. The psalmist tells us to number our days so that we will develop a heart of wisdom. You heard me say some time ago in uh, one of the New Year's messages uh, of an article in People magazine entitled Dead Ahead. And it told about a new clock that keeps track of how much time you have left to live. It calculates an average lifespan of 75 years for men and 80 years for women. So what you do is you program in your sex and age into the clock, and from then on, it will tell you how much time you have left to live. Boy, I don't know if I'd like that. <laughs> but the problem is, how the clock know that? You assume in 75 years as a man and 80 as a woman, but you don't even have that. But certainly that would give some perspective because you're seeing time tick away. Clock sold for 99.95. I don't know how many people got it, but I certainly didn't buy one. But the psalmist does tell us to number our days. In other words, be mindful the time is ticking and God is going to be holding us accountable. In fact, the Bible tells us not to count on tomorrow because tomorrow may not come for you or for me. All we have is right now, so our time on this earth is valuable because it is very limited. You know, a lot of people think that the most valuable thing in the world is gold. And you see all these gold commercials coming out uh, and all these spokesmen talking about gold, 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 gold. And, uh, and now they got cash for gold and so forth. You really get the impression gold is the most valuable thing on planet Earth. I'm here to tell you, no, sir. Time, time is the most valuable thing. You see, because gold gets exchanged, time gets lost. And so you need to make the most use of your time because time is limited. Secondly, make the most of every opportunity. Paul says here, make the most of every opportunity, and he gives a reason, because the days are evil. There are evil days that can eat up your time, that can take over your calendar, and cause you to become unfruitful and useless. Jesus said that Satan is a robber and a thief, and one of the things he tries to rob from us is our time, because time is a very precious, in fact, it is the most precious possession outside of our salvation. Just think of the time you've wasted already in sinning. Time you've wasted already in sinning. Think of the time wasted in bars, gambling, shallow affairs. Think of the time wasted in gossiping and spreading rumors. Think of the time wasted in being angry with somebody. Think of the time wasted in strained relationships that you, you can fix but you won't. Think of the time that's wasted. Think about all the wasted time worrying about the consequences of sins that you've committed. Friends, that is time that the devil is stealing away that you can never reclaim. You can never reclaim it. You can never reclaim it. And you understand? Whatever Satan can use to trip you up, to make you ineffective, to take away your witness and your impact, he will use that. And as you've heard me say many times, he's a master strategist and not a one of us in here is his equal. Even if we were his equal, he has an advantage. You gotta sleep, he don't need to sleep. 
And where there's only you one, who knows the billions of demo demonic spirits he can marshal to bring about his will where the only thing you could do is, is you, can't even, you can't even scratch in the middle of your back, much less put your hand forward to subvert his will in any way. Friends, we must make sure that we are entrusting our lives to a creator who is able to aid us, sustain us. We must be obedient to him. We must practice his will, for it's the only way we're going to be truly effective in what we do. But it is not just the sin that makes demands on our time. Sometimes even good things. You need to catch this. Sometimes it's not just sins that waste our time. Sometimes it's good things that we do that waste our time. Good things. You all hear me? Good things can waste our time. Point number one, or, or, or exhibit A. Jesus went to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He sat down to teach, and Mary was sitting at his feet, just soaking in every word. Meanwhile, Martha was out in the kitchen preparing dinner. You know the story. Martha gets upset because Mary is not in the kitchen, too. So she complains, Jesus, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, friends, was Martha committing a sin by fixing a meal in the kitchen? It had been a sin for her not to, <laughs> right? I mean, people got to eat. So she's not committing a sin. She, she's doing something that she believes is going to be beneficial. But look what's happening. She's fretful. She's, she, she's getting more and more upset. But here's a problem. She was so preoccupied with what she was doing that she didn't realize that God was in her living room talking. Let that soak in. Let that soak in. Let that soak in. God in your living room. Who has ever had an experience like this? He is giving words of wisdom. But you too busy doing something good. Friends, listen to me. You can be in ministry in this church. As I mentioned, some come when they're called to serve. And they come and then you don't see them. Friends, you're Martha. You're doing a good thing, but there needs to be time when you come and you sit under the teaching and the word of God and you are there. You are receiving the challenge. You are hearing what God's word said and you're getting, finding application for your life and you're saying, yes, I need to change. Yes, I see where God is calling me to make some, some shift in my life. Be careful of serving without input in your life. There must always be input. And input is not for hearing. Input is for doing. Amen. 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 Friends, Richard Swenson, a medical doctor, wrote a book in which he discusses one of the major maladies of our time that he says are anxiety and stress. You know people have fallen out from stress, right? He calls it overload, and he says that people are just plain overloaded. And friends, here's where I want to go right now. You're overloaded. Time is limited. You're overloaded. What are you going to do? Stay overloaded? Stay overloaded with the limited time that you have? What are you going to do? Friends, I'm calling you to make changes. You need to have yourself under the sound of the Word of God where proper instruction that will help you to change your life takes place. But you're overloaded. So what are you going to do? Time is limited. What are you going to do? Time is limited, you're overloaded, you're not getting to be before the Lord to hear his word, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How are we overloaded? Well, friends, we're overloaded with commitments. We made some commitments that um, have just gotten us in a bind. We don't have that kind of time. Not with all that we have to go through. We're, we've committed ourselves to go here and there, to take part in this activity and that social function. As a result... We soon begin meeting ourselves coming and going because we've overloaded ourselves in the area of our commitments. Ask yourself today, 
Lord, have I overcommitted myself? Now, some of you have taken up perhaps doing a course, you want to better yourself, but you know what? Some crises have happened at home, and that time now is too valuable. Friends, making a decision for ongoing discipleship may mean you lose our money. Okay. What amen? I feel good. What amen? Give me an amen. Sir. Amen. All right. As a pastor of this church, I can say I've been privileged. I remember sitting with two women who, uh, mothers, both overwhelmed. One told me, bathing their child while the child was sleeping and putting on makeup in the car on the way to work. Overwhelmed. I said, you don't see what the problem is? And I was able to help both of them to realize, you know what? They spoke to their husbands. You know, I ain't a husband. I, I can only suggest. I can And both of them realized, you know what? I need to change this job right now. This is not working. My family is struggling. My family is suffering. And folks, those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of, again, time is limited. You overload it. Only thing that, that, that matters is you, you, you hearing the word of God so that you can become a full-blown disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, your, your job is not the end all. You're, you're, you're building your family in the ways of God, be, becoming a, a, producing a legacy of godliness uh, where the decisions you make will affect your great-great-grandchildren to produce a godly life for them. That's what you want. You don't want to know that your negligence in the home has created a, a family of drunkards, crooks, thieves, uh, um, or, or just layabouts who have no sense of purpose in their life and for whom God is a stranger. You don't want to know you did that because you were somehow seduced into thinking that your job was more important than your family. We're overloaded with possessions. Our closets are full, our garages are overflowing. We've gone into debt to pay for all of these things that we simply must have, and now we're so afraid that someone will steal them. We're overloaded in the area of our possessions. Some, some things we need to let go of. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. It gone. That had too much of a hole on me, too much of an attachment. Let it go. Give it up for the Lord. Thirdly, we're overloaded in the area of work. We get up early, fight traffic, and experience intolerable working conditions because we have to if we're going to pay for all those possessions we've accumulated. Friends, don't let the devil put us on a treadmill. We've got to work out what are the real priorities of life and stick to those. A focused life built on the things that are truly important, that have eternal value and worth, these are what we need to be about. Anything else is a distraction, a waste of time. Fourthly, there's also an information overload. I referred to this a little earlier. Uh, this Svensson author wrote that as a doctor, he is he has to read over 220 articles a month just to keep up with all the changes in his profession. Now, Charles, I don't know if that is, is that way with you, but, um, and now with the in internet, there's an information superhighway. But the problem is that we can't possibly absorb it all, so we feel an overload in these areas. Well, I could go on and on, but you get the picture. There are many demands on our time, so many good things that need to be done. But friends, there is about, let's see how many hours we have left of this year. We have about 2,496 hours left in this year. And um, you've, you've used up uh, about 5,000 5, of this year's hours already. We do want to make the most of every opportunity, so what do we do? I've established time is limited. I've established that we're overloaded. I've established that, that we are finding ourselves overwhelmed, so what do we do? What do we do? Well, it comes to our third point. Understand what the Lord's will is. And doesn't that make sense? If you gotta be accountable to God, your time is limited, you're overwhelmed, distracted, harassed, and harried. Don't you want the sole peace of knowing, you know what, even though I couldn't get everything done, I got the right things done. You've heard me say from this pulpit a number of times, 
Jesus went to his death and back up into heaven itself, and he said, I have completed the work you had for me to do. And you say, ah? Huh? There was still the lost in Israel. There was still the unsaved in Israel. There were still lepers in Israel. There was still the blind in Israel. There was still the lame. They were all still there. What Jesus mean? He's finished the work God gave him to do. Here, he's finished the work that God gave him to do. Friends, that is purpose. That is purpose. That is purpose. You can't do it all. But what you can do is have a sense that you're doing what you know God wants you to be doing. And that, my friends, is soul satisfaction. I know what it is to feel like I could lose all my hair. I lose in some of it already. And just, you don't know if you're coming or going. And, and, and it's th at those times, you remind yourself, what's your purpose? What's God's purpose for your life? And friends, when you can do that, you know what to let go of. You can't hold on to two cow tail. You can't. This thing that is pulling you away from full orb discipleship in the Lord Jesus Christ, there's only one solution. You, you can't do this. You can't do that. Let it go. And instantly there's this recoil in the right direction. Let it go. Some things you got to let go of, friends. Understand what the Lord's will is and do it. Paul tells us, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Friends, it is foolishness to continue to do what you're doing without change. It's foolishness. You're overwhelmed. You cannot do all that you are doing. And if you ca can, can do all that you are doing, I'm telling you, you're not doing it as effectively as you can. And so we're told not to be foolish, but to understand what the Lord's will is. What do you think the Lord's will is for you this year? Do you think he wants your mind so saturated with worries and anxieties that you can't think spiritual thoughts? Do you think he wants your calendar so crowded that you don't have time for the important things? Do you? No. Don't fill up your calendar with things that will ultimately be no, of no benefit to you and your family and its, um, and its upliftment and fulfillment. Don't let anxieties crowd out you being able to have your mind at peace so that you can properly direct your family and establish a family altar where your family is grounded in spiritual things. Friends, listen, nothing else is worth it. You got the ladder leaning up against the wrong wall. Get to the top of that and it's empty. You mean I waste all this time, energy, sweat, equity to get up here and ain't nothing up here except empty promises? No, friends. What is God's will for you to be about? Well, first, let's put it this way. The first thing you need to do is establish your priorities. You've got to establish what your priorities are and what they ought to be. What are your priorities? Set some goals with the following questions in mind. Will this goal glorify God? Will this goal glorify God? Ask that about the job you find yourself in. Will this goal, uh, will this thing glorify God? Now, you're a Christian, friend. Now, if there's non-Christians listening in, in the audience, you could still benefit from this. But if you're a Christian, you say you represent in life, thought, behavior, spending, everything that Jesus Christ is about, that question becomes paramount. Does this goal bring glory to God? Because your whole life is about bringing glory to God. That's what you say. That's what you sign on to when you become a Christian. Will this bring glory to God? Period, full stop. First place you want to start. Here's what the Bible says. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I can tell you, even preaching, there's some preachers love the sound of their own voice. There's some preachers love the, the applause and the accolades. Love it! Love it. 
I preach for the glory of God. I preach for the glory of God. There's no temptation more seductive than the applause of men. You hear me? There's no temptation to be pop, greater than to be popular and loved and, and hailed. And Why do you think politicians can't let go of power? Huh? Why do you think some pastors just, I mean, they just love to have everybody eating out of their hands? Why do you think the word of God is not made clear in this country? Because the word of God is a hard word. You got to tell people you in sin and you need to repent. That don't win friends and influence people. You could tell Jesus that don't make you popular. And so friends, whatever you do, now only you could figure this out. Whatever you do, Make sure you do it for the glory of God. And don't play no mind tricks on yourself. Is this glorifying to God or is it not? Powerful um, um, teaching was on the internet the other day about sexuality in the Christian church. This preacher was dropping it red. He said, you can't say you is no Christian and you all about fornicating all over the place. You're not a Christian. That don't, ma that don't match up. You can't say you a Christian and you all about uh, um, committing adultery in your marriage. You're not a Christian. Christians don't carry on like that. The Bible says such you were, not present tense are. And he goes on and I said to myself, boy, this is a hard word, but he's right. You see, when Christ enters the heart, there's change. There ain't a veneer of Christianity. There's change that goes to the core of who you are because who you are is ugly. You have an Adamic nature. There's an ugliness inside of you. No matter how good you think you are, you're not that pretty. And the word of God presented in front of you, you begin to realize there's an ugliness in me that must go under the knife. Must be crucified. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live. The problem is we have been saved but it's still I who lived in the church. Friends, that's not what a Christian is. You need to be crucifying yourself, your passions, your ambitions. Bring them under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them purify them. Give them to you in a way that you can live to the praise of his glory. Establish your priorities. God wants you to honor him in your life. He stands in our life. He expects us to establish priorities. So, so ask yourself, who is the most important person in my life? And I'm hoping your answer will be my relationship with God through Jesus Christ is most important to me. And if so, then put that at the top of your list of priorities. And say, this will affect my decisions, my scheduling, my relationship with others, and my whole outlook on life. If he is not the head of your priorities, Everything else remains the same. But if he is, everything else falls in line. You got me? Therefore, when Sunday rolls around, neither rain nor shine nor football kickoffs will interfere with my being at church because he comes first in my life. I'll worship the Lord and nothing will interfere with that. Friends, when you're serious about this, nothing gets in the way. I know we have football Christians. Friends, listen, no, 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 football ain't die for you. Nor does football require an accounting of your life at the end of your day. But God does. Friends, whether it's football, basketball, any other kind of ball, any other kind of thing, we must be accountable to God. Amen. You also need to schedule some definite time each day to pray and to read his word. Pray for yourself and your family and for people around you. Pray for the church and for the missionaries. Sometimes they feel so alone out there and so far away, but... Sometimes they know when someone's praying for them. They can feel it. You'll never know how much your prayers will mean to them, but you'll be blessed as you grow in your faith and trust in him. Okay. Um, there are many goals you can have in life. Not all of them are good or bad, but make sure they are goals that glorify the Lord. B, will this goal make me more like Jesus? Ask yourself the question. Is this goal helping me to become more like Jesus? C, will this goal make a positive contribution to the world? 
Some things aren't necessarily wrong as goals, they're just not all that important. One way to make this distinction is to measure the goal's positive impact on others. Will this goal make a positive contribution to my family, coworkers, church, community, and the world? D, will this goal enhance my ability to witness or will it destroy it? Everything that we are involved in with other people is an opportunity to witness. Friends, if this is not an opportunity to witness and you're part of something, question why you're in it. Now again, I'm not talking to just nice people. I'm talking to people who say that they're Christian, all right? Who are saying that they represent Christ in everything that they are, everything they do. So if you're a part of something and you have no ability to be a witness, question why you're in it. Question why you're in it. One way to make this distinction, sorry, um, everything that we are involved with with other people is an opportunity to witness. Do any of your goals intentionally involve you being with unsaved people to be a witness to them? Things like joining the Rotary Club, a tennis league, joining in a health club, going as a chaperone on school trips with your children, inviting a neighbor over for dessert. Do you have any goals that specifically get you involved with people who need to know Jesus Christ? If not, why not? Once you've made some goals and some resolution, these goals have to be translated into activities. A lot of us set worthy goals, but then nothing happens. Here's the danger. You set a goal. It's, it's noble. It's admirable. It's, it's profound. But nothing happens. Here's what you need to do. Organize your activities around these categories. Remember the big stone illustration? Professor comes up with a big old glass bowl, and he fills it with big, 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 big rocks. And he says to the people, is this full? He said, yeah, yeah, no stones right to the top. He says, oh, really? Reaches down, grabs some pebbles, pours the pebbles in. And right to the top. He says, is this full? He says, yeah, oh, it's full now. He says, oh, really? Reaches down, grabs some sand, pours the sand in. And he asks the class again, is this full? Silence. He says, you're right, it's not full. Reaches down, grabs some water. Pours the water in. Ask the class, what lesson have I taught you? Gave lots of answers. Uh, some were, well, you can always fit more things into your schedule. He says, no, 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 no. He said, if you don't put the big things in first, you'll never, need, never be able to get them in at all. And friends, there's some big ticket priority items that you need to, as a Christian, have in place, or you will never, for all your good intentions, get them in. You must schedule the priority items in your life. And I want to end there. Friends, if we are going to be people who change, if discipleship is going to happen, there are big ticket items that you can afford to leave alone. Your family is your number one priority after your relationship with God. It is your number one priority. Your relationship with God, your ongoing salvation is a first paramount and priority. Are you under the sound of the word of God? Are you in a place where you're growing in your faith? Are you being held accountable to anybody else? If that's not the case, you've not made it a priority. It needs to be a priority. Then it's your family. It's your family. Your family needs your input, your godly passing on of spirituality. It needs that. If you don't put that in, it won't happen. How many of us fathers can say with great pain, we have not made our families a priority? And our families are pained and hurting because we have time for everything else than for them. How many of our wives can say to us, I don't feel like I'm your priority? I'm sure every, every male hand in here would go up. Why? Because we have not scheduled it in. You can't talk this because it's felt. And so as we make a determination this year to organize these categories around our personal life and how we can get closer by reading the Word of God, perhaps a light, lamp lighter program, as we, as we look at our life and we look at our families and, and realize that we need to make a more concerted effort, spending time as a family, eating together around the dinner table, um, making sure that we have those quality moments together, uh, making sure that the Word of God is central and paramount in our discussions, and, and as we consider how we can be more involved and included in the church's life. You realize there's some members in this church I can count on, but the problem is I can count on them too much. They're in three and four and five ministries. But I also know that there's some members, boy, you need a crowbar to move them out of that place of non-activity. 
and you say, but God, it's not fair. It's just not fair. Lord, all of us are under the sound of the word of God. All of us are trying to build this wonderful church that you've allowed us to be a part of by your grace and by your Holy Spirit's enablement. But why is it that only some people seem to get that this requires all of our efforts? It's not fair, God. Why should a Stephanie Lund Hannah be so overwhelmed with all that she has to do as a wife, a mother, and a, a worker, and so many things, when someone is sitting idly by saying, boy, Steph is a dedicated Christian woman, eh? And ain't doing nothing. I don't think Steph needs those kinds of accolades. You know how you can compliment the Stephanies and the Allisons uh, of this church? Come alongside them and help. Come alongside them and do your part for the church's life. Put yourself under the word of God. Allow yourself to be challenged in an environment where you can change for the glory of God. Get involved more with your family. Get involved more with your church. And as we do this, God will bring about the necessary change. We're going to sing now, and then I'm going to close with uh, a prayer for all of us that God would do his work in us. Brother Cyril. They say that where your treasure is, there will your heart.